All right, hello. Uh, it is shortly after one o'clock. Thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. My name is Tommy Valentine. I'm the Executive Director of Historic Athens, and you're tuned in to This Moment in History, COVID-19 in Athens, Georgia. We wanna thank you so much for joining us for what is our 31st episode out of 55. Uh, for those of you that enjoyed today's program and would like to go back and see previous episodes, including interviews with business owners, uh, elected officials, community figures, um, you can find that in the video section of this Facebook page. Uh, if you would like to see our list of upcoming guests, we're going to share that halfway through this program, um, but also stay tuned to our Facebook page. Make sure to follow or like uh, Historic Athens on Facebook. Um, one last note before we begin. Uh, if this is your first episode that you've tuned into, we want you to know what the purpose of the program is and how you can participate. Um, this is not just a Facebook live cast for you to watch. This is something you can participate in through your questions, your comments, your words of encouragement, um, however you'd like. Uh, at the conclusion of all 55 episodes, our goal is to have a digital archive that captures this moment in Athens history so that we can submit it to local libraries and research institutions. Now, you can be part of that historic record by submitting a comment below this video. As long as we're still live, I'll have the ability to show it on screen, we can address it live, and you can be part of that historic record that we submit to those local libraries. So uh, we want to thank you again for tuning in. And now it's time to introduce today's guest. We know that it's Memorial Day, and so uh, we certainly uh, want to make sure we honor that occasion. We also appreciate that, that means that today's guest took time out of their Memorial Day to be with us. So today we have Dr. Zanona Thomas. Uh, she is the interim superintendent at Clark County School District. I'll say as a uh, as many of you who have watched this program know, because it comes up frequently, I'm a proud CCSD graduate. And so we're really thrilled to be able to document the effect that this has had on Clark County School District and the teachers, administrators, and other staff that populate our schools. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and make a few clicks here, and I'm gonna go ahead and bring uh, Dr. Thomas onto the program with us. So bear with me just one second, and then I will welcome her onto the show. All right, great. Uh, Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, one second. Uh, let me just correct one quick thing on your audio. Perfect. Okay, Dr. Thomas, thanks again. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you for having me. Of course. So uh, I think that increasingly, you're a, a well-known figure in this community. I mean, you have been for quite some time. Uh, you have a long relationship with Athens and uh, with Clark County School District, but there may be some people tuning in who don't know you um, or who don't know very much about your work in the community. Could you take a few minutes just to introduce yourself and talk about your past here in Athens? Yes, I am a native Athenian. I've been in Athens all of my life, spent the majority of my professional career working in Clark County Schools, I guess about 20 of my 28 years have been in Clark County. I began as a school social worker, um, spent some time in Oconee County as a school social worker and assistant principal and a principal, and then came back in 2009 and had the privilege of being able to open um, Clark County's first charter school, was, which was Judia Jackson Harris Elementary on Danielsville Road. And so I was there um, until from 2009 until 2018, I think it was. And Dr. Means um, named me his chief of staff. And I've been at the district office since that time. Now, uh, JJ Harris is a really phenomenal school. It's one that, uh, you, you know, I think about, there are so many folks that when they think of Athens, especially for those folks that come here for four years, fall into a routine and stay. Where J.J. Harris is, that whole area of Athens is very much Athens, but I think for some folks, they don't spend a lot of time up there. They don't really know much about the neighborhoods or uh, you know, Catulpa Way or the, the people up there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the culture of J.J. Harris and how that influenced you? Um, so you're right. J.J. Harris is off of Danielsville Road and it's not a highly populated area in terms of business and industry. It's more residential. Families are out there um, in that area. We had 
we were a major majority minority school um, when I was there and still is about the same. We were about 65% Hispanic during that time, about 27% African-American. So um, that school was, the way it's zoned, it fit for students of a minority background, but it allowed us the opportunity to be really creative and do some innovative instruction. We were a um, school-wide enrichment model school. We were the first professional development school. So we did some things that were different and unique to try to ensure that our students were able to receive an equitable education comparable to what those received on the other sides of town. You know, one of the things that we hear about a lot with Clark County School District is how uh, lots of folks wish we had more native Athenians involved in local education. You clearly got snagged into that. You got pulled into local education and you've, you've been serving in that way for a career now. Uh, what compelled you to enter into education here? It um, was not my plan, but clearly a, a plan uh, that was for me. And um, I grew up wanting to be a pharmacist and then ended up going into journalism. So I have an undergraduate degree from UGA in journalism and public relations mm -hmm. concentration. And then I went immediately back to graduate school and received my master's in social work. And beginning that work in schools, I still did not initially think that would be my long-term career. I thought I was going to open a private practice, um, mm -hmm. therapy, counseling and therapy, and uh, found myself in schools and fell in love with students and working with families and working with the community. You know, it's like you look up and it's 10 years and then it's 20 years. And I can't believe now that I've been doing this for 28 years. And so it was clearly a, a plan that was for my life. It was just not the one if I had had to speak what that plan was, <laughs> that it would have been, oh, I'm going to be in education for my entire career but I wouldn't change anything in it if I could. Yeah, I, th I think one of my favorite expressions I heard somewhere is, you know, if you want to make God laugh, make plans. Right. Um, right. right. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in people that, I, I certainly fall in this category, a lot of my best friends do, that as they were finding their path, they, they went down a few different roads, but they weren't afraid to switch gears when it was clear that it was time to. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really fascinated at this intersection of journalism, social work, and education. You know, what for you, what's the through line between those three? What what did those three have in common that they each pulled at you at different times in your life? Communication. Mm. Um, you know, journalism is written communication, but it's also spoken communication. Social work and counseling is about communicating communicating your thoughts, your feelings, your concerns. And education is about communication, whether that is teaching our students in the most effective way, whether that's helping our students learn how to communicate their feelings, their thoughts, their interests, how to be social activists and um, mm -hmm. end up for themselves and express what their needs are and how those needs can just best be met by us as a school system. So all of that to me, and all of them really bring in people and working with people and understanding people. Um, so, you know, when I first got out of, well, I never really went into journalism as a career, but I thought, oh goodness, this has been a waste of my parents' money and my four years of education. But I look back and I use that probably every day and especially the public relations part it's about keeping your hand on the pulse of public opinion and as a district leader even as a school leader you're constantly having to monitor what that public opinion and perception is and how you can engage that public in the most effective way to help meet the needs of your organization and of course the counseling part you're doing that every day whether it's with yourself right staff, with parents, with students, because um, a lot of times when people are angry, what I've learned is they just want to be heard. They want to have a voice. 
And, you know, the social work part is, is a liaison between the home and the school and the community. That's what school social work is. And so making that connection. So when I look back, it all has worked perfectly together, but it's never ingredients that I would have lined up to set me to where I am today. Right. You know, I, our first conversation, mine and yours, I, I mentioned to you that, uh, you know, I, I was a proud member of the Gaines gang. I think it became the Gaines Golden Eagles partway through, uh, then the Hillsman Panther, then Cedar Shoals Jaguar. And it's funny, you know, I, I mean, I am a full grown adult, but I really mean it when I say I'm proud of those, those three periods of my life. And I meet so many other people that graduated from Clark County School District that their pride for where they went to school, K through 12, rivals the kind of pride you hear from folks who, you know, they're undergraduate or, you know, they're, they're co whatever college they graduated right. from. You even see folks, uh, you know, still as passionate about Cedar Central rivalries or things like that into adulthood as some people are about Georgia, Florida or things like that. Why do you think, it wasn't until I was an adult and I, I started interacting with people that went to other school districts that I realized that that kind of local pride is not typical. You don't see that everywhere in every school district. Um, why do you think Clark County School District engenders that kind of passion and pride from its graduates? I think maybe it um, goes back to the kind of community we have. I, mm. Athens Clark is a very strong community. And so when you talk about the schools, that's a community. And so it seems that just being a part of Athens Clark County, it naturally builds that sense of commitment in you. Mm -hmm. Those who are from here or who have moved here and become a part of this area, you see a sense of oneness, a sense mm -hmm. of wanting to help, wanting to be supportive. I mean, you, you couldn't have seen that more than we have over the last three or four months. And so that sense of caring for each other, reaching out to each other, being there, there is a sense of pride there. And so I believe that that kind of spilled over into our schools. And many of our parents today were students themselves. And so, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I grew up as, you know, under the Billy Henderson era, and there was mm -hmm. nothing greater than being a gladiator in the mid to late 1980s. I mean, it was about, so there was this competition, um, not just locally, but statewide. And you wanted to support your schools. You wanted to be a part, mm -hmm. proud to be a part of that. And it wasn't just athletic, you know, academically, we had so many people that were successful, but I do believe that athletics is what brought people together. And you still see that that's the one thing one area where people come together across races, across socioeconomics, across gender, and you are pulling for and believing in something as a unified group. And um, I think that that kind of, I don't know, sense of oneness that started years back because so many of our families do stay here generationally, that's passed on to their children, that there's just a true sense of pride in in your school and in your community. Yeah. The, the last que general question I have about your area of work, and then we'll, we'll move on to more current issues. But, you know, I'm wondering about how your role as a native Athenian has aided you and your ability to do your work. I'll, 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 editorial, I'll editorialize it for a second. I know that uh, as the community was waiting to hear who was going to take on the interim role of superintendent, uh, at a time where I don't know if I heard much of any, any agreement <laughs> about our school district, there were so many hot takes about different perceptions in our school district. Uh, when it was announced that with you, there was kind of a, a general consensus of happiness. Like people clearly felt like you had local connections that would enable you to do this job well. So, so can you outline that for us? Like, how, how is be being not just someone who's been here for decades as a professional, but also your local roots, 
Um, how does that tie into the way you approach the job? Um, it's personal. Mm. So I know what Clark County has been. So for me, I know what Clark County can be. Mm. I know what's been produced from here. Um, I know that equity is possible. I know that success is possible no matter where you're coming from, public housing or five points. I know that um, all of our students can succeed. And I know that from my own personal experiences as a student, but mm -hmm. then I'm a parent. And so I have a true commitment to wanting our schools to be the best they can be. I, you know, I have one child that's graduated and I have one that's about to be a senior and I want her to be competitive. I want her mm -hmm. to have every opportunity that she wants for herself. And I don't just want that for her. I want that for every one of her classmates. I want that for every student K-12. And so when I look at our academic performance as of late, and when I hear some of the conversation and dialogue about our children, it's personal for me. Um, mm. I know that our children can learn. I know that Black children can learn. I know that poor children can learn. I, some of the smartest kids I grew up with came out of Bethel homes. One of the kids that was the highest grade, you know, had the highest grades in my class grew up in Bethel homes. So I know that it's not about where you come from. It's about where you know that you can go. And I know the power of educators in helping students to recognize their own ability. And so for me, it's just about, I'm not someone just looking at numbers. These are my classmates' children or my classmates' grandchildren. And I don't know, I'm just not jaded by this belief that because right. of color, or because they're poor, they can't succeed. And I know that from firsthand experience, so. You know, I, uh, I'm i gonna break the promise I just made, which is I said that was the last general question, but you just opened <laughs> up 300 things I wanna talk about. Um, but, all right, so <clears throat> the first is, a, is kind of a rose tinted glasses question, okay? okay? I think everyone who looks back at their childhood there's a degree of feeling like those were the good old days or uh, or maybe something's been lost. When I grew up in, in Clark County schools, uh, I mean, I, I usually use the lunch table analogy. I, I remember at Cedar, pretty much everybody would sit at different lunch tables all the time. There was a lot of camaraderie across social economic status, across race. Um, you didn't just have token friends of other demographics, you had Le legitimate rich mm -hmm. relationships. And I'm not saying we were fulfilling Dr. King's dream yet or anything, but it just felt like we were making progress. Um, there were still issues. I still remember noticing even back then how bizarre it was that some of my smartest friends weren't in gifted uh, or so-called gifted spectrum. Mm -hmm. I remember that was a really eye-opening thing of sometimes being in these AP classes and not feeling challenged by some of the people I was in study groups with, whereas in some of my general classes, I'd run across people with just dazzling intellects that ha hadn't been pulled into that so-called gifted cohort. Um, so there were issues, but it seemed like there might have been some headway. Do you feel like, uh, let, let me ask it to you, I guess, in the best possible way that I can think of. <laughs> What opportunities are there right now to maybe regain some past ground, but also to innovate? Do you, do you see any uh, any chances to kind of sew people closer together while also fighting for that equity you were talking about? Hmm. I think we have to go back to a place where 
learning is not optional. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about rose colored glasses, I do think back to my childhood. Um, but there was a standard and it was a non-negotiable standard that was set. Now, a lot of that started at home. Um, and I think we're going to have to find new and creative ways to have more of a pervasive expectation for all of our students. We have a community engagement department. We have a position dedicated to that. Unfortunately, we had just really gotten started strongly with that work before the pandemic came. But how do we reach out to community businesses? How do we reach out to parents? How do we reach out to churches to help us establish that culture of expectation? How do we ensure that every teacher has a belief that every child can learn? How do we help teachers um, build relationships with students that aren't antagonistic, but that are um, filled with expectation? I keep going back to that word, but I, I believe that children will rise to the standard that we set for them. Mm. Seen it in my own career, and I don't think it's a, a black or white thing. Um, some of my fondest memories of teachers were white teachers. I have some mm. wonderful, fond memories of teachers who were of color, but it wasn't just that only I could only connect with teachers that look like me. I've seen right. that in my own children, you know, some of their the teachers that pushed them the most looked like them, but then there were others who did not look like them. I've had challenges with teachers who looked like my kids, who I felt didn't have my children's best interest at heart. And so we have to get to a place where, you know, and you're never going to be at 100%, Tommy, we get that. But learning was non-negotiable for me. Um, I had teachers who said, I know you can, and because I know you can, you will, um, you know, giving work back wasn't that they were being difficult. It was that they knew we were capable of doing better saying you will right. fix this. I'm not going to accept, you know, mediocre when I know you're capable of doing more. And if you're not capable, then it's my job to help get you there. Um, right. and so I, I keep going back to that word, but it's expectations and um, connections and relationships. I, I listen to kids talk a lot. I listen personally. I listen when I'm at the Career Academy and they know when teachers truly care about them and want what's best for them. And those are the teachers that they say they can't stand, but those are the teachers now that they're away from that they miss the most and they love right. them and they're yearning to have them in their lives again. And um, it's like that tough love. It's like your parent, you know, who right. won't accept no when they know you can do better. So, you know, I I, I need to tilt us to COVID-19, but I, I will just, I, I want to agree and acknowledge with what you just shared about teachers with high expectations. I don't know if you, in your career you ever got to meet uh, Miss Neal who taught uh, English and literature at a uh, Cedar Shoals High School. Um, uh, like you mentioned with having teachers that are different than you. I mean, she was an African-American woman. She was by far the strictest English teacher I ever had. Uh, she used to make us handwrite on white paper with lined paper underneath it, the first two drafts of any paper we had to write before we could even type it. Um, and you'd work your butt off. And then that was the first teacher I ever ran into that you could really just grind it out and she would still give you a C or a B, you know, she, uh, she was very old school. And yet when I got to college, the reason I was ready to write right away. And I mean, there were other great teachers along the way, Dr. Patty McWhorter and others, but, um, but it was Miss Neal that those expectations, you carry those expectations forever. 
And I'm sure I was a pain in the butt student to have, but every time I'd see her years later, I'd always thank her again and again. Uh, in fact, the thing that sent me back to grad school was finding an old paper I had written in ninth grade and realizing, I don't think I can write this well anymore. You know, uh, it, it, I mean, uh, just quickly, do you, do you have a teacher like that that comes to mind, someone that had to do tough love with you? You know, it's interesting um, when I was listening to you talk and it wasn't even a content class, but I was seeing Miss Theodora Maxwell and anyone in my age range that went to Clark Central knew her. She taught business and back then she taught typing and we had to take timed typing tests every week. And she walked around with this ruler in her hand. I can still see it and feel it like it was yesterday. And she was so stern and it was, you know, eyes on the copy because you had to look at a, you know, a paper that was on a stand and hands in position begin. And we had to type without looking and you had to keep your wrist up in position. And when those wrists would drop, she would pop that hand, you know, not in an abusive way, not <laughs> right. you felt that we were on your hand. And it was like, get that wrist up. But now I can sit and have a full conversation. And I'll say to a teacher or a student, I'm listening to you and I can listen and never take my eyes off of them and pretty much type paragraphs without ever looking down. And that skill took me from high school through college, through professional, I could write my papers easily. I could, you know, and I can type now and I can put information out. And at that time I was like, oh God, here comes Miss Maxwell. Cause she would walk in, you know, and she was just, but she was pristine in her presence, in her speaking and in her expectations. Yeah. And, you know, you were at that time, we're like, what's the big deal if my wrist drops, right? Right. You know, why do I not need to look at the keyboard? Um, but it made me, and it wasn't then just about typing so much as it was about getting things right, right. and doing it well and not half-heartedly giving effort. And so she taught really a life lesson in that um, as well as a lifetime skill. And there are many, yeah. many other teachers I could name, you know, that did the same thing. But I, that's like a class I see myself utilizing every day because I type so much and kids now look, you know, because they are texters and they're like, are you not looking at the keyboard? No, Miss Maxwell would not let me look at the keyboard. <laughs> so, yeah, she, I, I'm sure on some level when you're, if your hands get out of position, you're, you know, half expecting that ruler to come out. Of yeah, I, I do. <laughs> And I, I do want to say, uh, this is such a good point because so many of the teachers that are memorable when you're in high school uh, or in any level of school, even if you can't remember the content they taught you, even if that's faded, you know, whatever history they taught you or or this or that, it's the discipline and self expectation. That's what you carry with you. You know that the need to do something well. So, right. and actually I just, I wanna see, we have some comments here. I'm gonna yes. show this. Alex Sam uh, just chimed in to say uh, that he had Miss Maxwell too and loved her. Um, and then Milton is gonna get us back on track here. Milton Leathers uh, just shared the following. I think it's a great question, Milton. Thank you so I much. Agree. So how can our schools make the most of the many good lessons this pandemic is teaching us how can we continue to use, even enhance the good? That's an interesting question because this is, you know, so often we're focused on the difficulty, the stress, the complication from, uh, and, and often the tragedy that's coming from this uh, pandemic. But is there any good that you see, Dr. Thomas, that you can carry on? Oh, definitely. And I think I was reading his comment as well. And I've used a quote in some of the communications I've sent out to families about how do we create a new good. Um, I think that we have learned so much. We've learned that there are new ways we can do things. We've learned that um, we don't have to come together face to face for every meeting. We've learned <laughs> we will be able to be more efficient. Um, you know, I've found right now that we're not necessarily 
because <laughs> I figure out why, but you know, today, so for all of us, um, you know, if you have a job, you get up, you go to work, you do your job. And every day is pretty similar to the day before with just a few twists to that. Uh, but now almost everything we're doing is new. And so mm. when you get up every day, you you don't have a playbook to say, this is how you respond to teaching kids six feet apart. Um, you know, and so we've had a playbook for much of what we do in education, and that's very different now. And so it is requir- requiring a lot more thinking and problem solving and and time. So you find yourselves on Zoom for 10 hours a day and you still have only gotten through half of your list. But what Zoom has taught us is that we don't have to pull principals out of the buildings once we return for every meeting. We can have a two hour mm. Zoom meeting and make it interactive and get them the information they need. So that's a new good, you know. Um, we've learned that students can really be taught differently. Now, were we prepared for that when this started? No, we weren't. But now we're at a place of recognizing that there are some good digital platforms out there that we can utilize to supplement what we're doing because we all recognize that we will probably be back in the place that we've been now again in a few months. I mean, that's what all the forecasts are telling us. So, you know, how do we create a new good of blended learning? And um, I was in conversations this morning with our chief academic officer about how do we ensure that our teachers have the supports and the confidence that they need to be ready in October or January or whenever we return here to ensure that we're giving our students quality, rigorous, equitable learning opportunities. That's very different than doing that mid to late March because you can say, oh, we've taught three fourths of the year, but if you're doing that in October, there's a lot of learning that still has to happen. So what new good can we find? How do we ensure that teachers feel comfortable and that they have the resources and tools that they need to support our students in a new way. You know, I've heard people say that things would never go back to how we once knew them, that things, you know, not a hundred percent back to how we've done things, but, you know, grocery stores had started the click picking up, right? They had started the delivered to your home. They had started where you could just drive up and get the groceries you've ordered. And now you see a new good. I mean, that's not horrible. People are learning to embrace that new way. So I think Mr. Leathers is right. We have to challenge ourselves to see what have we learned? How can we be more efficient in our work, but still be equally or more effective in our work? I don't want to um, give up effectiveness for efficiency, but how do we now push ourselves to ensure that we're doing both? And there really is some good that can come out of this. I've looked at um, read, and I'm sure many of you have about the state of California and how they're, you know, getting rid of SAT and ACT now for college admissions. Um, at some of the colleges, and they said they had been talking about doing this. So this has kind of pushed us in the field of education to say, is this really necessary? So, you know, those colleges are saying, no, it's not. You know, are these tests truly reflective of what our students can do? Are these tests equitable? And they are not. So, you know, when you read it, talked about students of color, students from poverty, um, you know, and so I'm like, oh, those are our kids. We've been saying right. for years that many of the standardized tests that we give aren't designed to, to truly measure what all students know. So now institutions of higher learning are saying, yeah, you're right. We're going to create our own tests. Um, so people are pushed to look at things differently and to assess if what we've been doing was the best or were we doing it because we've always done it that way? And so I just believe that this will be a great opportunity for us 
to extend ourselves as educators and to find new ways to meet the needs of all of our children. Um, and they're gonna, you know, it's not gonna be without challenge. We have to make sure that every child has internet access. How can we work with our businesses to make sure that we're getting those hotspots? You know, um, do we need to put hotspots in community neighborhoods that are strong enough for our kids to get at home? But that's not bad either, you know? And so there's a lot out there that we will be able to do to challenge ourselves to ensure that we're meeting the needs of, of all of our children, telemedicine, telenursing, you know, those kinds of things to be able to support families. We've already started with the health clinic at Hillsman and Gaines, but how do we extend those types of resources to support our students and their families? So I think he's exactly right. There will be things we can do. We have to establish a new good and um, right. even a new better, you know, we can do a new better. It doesn't just have to be acceptable. We can find ways, but we have to get out of our comfort zones and that's going to be the challenging part. Speaking of challenging, I know earlier you mentioned that sometimes you have to counsel yourself. This has definitely <laughs> been a time where leaders are having to counsel themselves. Uh, so many of the community figures and leaders we've spoken to on this program have admitted and talked about the, the amount of stress, especially in the, those early days where it became clear this was going to change the way we did everything. How did you counsel yourself throughout that process? How did you calibrate for this moment? I didn't do a good job of that, Tommy. Mm. When it first started, it was actually spring break and my husband and I had traveled. It was his birthday and we had gone to New Orleans of all places to to celebrate. Wow. And I was in the hotel room probably 85% of the time we were gone on calls, you know, meeting with um, area superintendents, meeting with Mr. Thaxton here who was coordinating the efforts for Athens Clark County, meeting with our leadership team. And, you know, I, I looked up one day and Honestly, it was six o'clock and I hadn't eaten all day. And, you know, finally my husband came in and he said, you have to stop. You, you know, you've got to take an hour just to eat. And so at first I didn't do a good job of that. And I, I think many of us didn't. You know, it was one of those things that you hear about somewhere else, but for some reason you think that it doesn't apply to you. You know, oh, it will never get that bad here. And um, you just keep, seeing, believing, oh, that's something in the news. You know, I feel like I was acting like a 15 year old and I felt like for some reason, Clark County was invincible and it was never gonna hit us the way it had hit other parts of the world. And um, that was hard. It was very stressful, you know, and I've looked a lot and read a lot about the, the trauma. This is tremendous, you know, it's, it's like 9-11, it's like, um, other things we've faced in our history. And it's something we've never dealt with before. So as I talked about for education, it's the same way in a social emotional realm. We don't know how to cope with this. And right. I think it's going to be critical that we help our students with the trauma. We help our families with the trauma, but we also have to help staff because secondhand trauma can be just as powerful or harmful, should I say. And um, so we can't forget the impacts that this is going to have on us all emotionally and the impacts it's having for families who have not been able to work, you know. Yeah, I'm stressed and I haven't calibrated, but I am still being paid. You know, my family can still eat. Our lights are still on. Um, the car note's still paid. And so at least I'm only dealing with the work stress. I'm not dealing with the home stress. But what about for so many families, you know, how this is impacting them? And that's hurting teachers. That's hurting principals because those are our children too. And so I think that's why we saw so many people coming out wanting to help when we were doing the feeding and teachers were wanting to see their kids because they needed to know that those babies were okay. They needed to know that they were getting what they needed. They needed to put their eyes on them. You know, teaching is so much more than a job. It becomes your life and those children become your children. 
And so the worry that we have for them and ensuring that they're able to be okay and that they're getting what they need and the fact that you can't put your hands on them and give them that hug and say, baby, it's going to be all right. I mean, that's stressful for teachers um, right. and for leaders. And so I, I haven't calibrated like I should. And I don't think that most of our education professionals have done a good job with that. And you want to get it right. But you don't even know what right looks like. You know what I mean? And then you have a community who yeah. everyone has an opinion. Everyone knows what they think it should look like. Everyone wants to be included. Everyone wants to be at the table. And it's so ironic you ask that because for some reason people view schools differently. Like no one's really picking up the phone, calling publics and telling them that I want to be there when you decide which way we can walk down the aisles. <laughs> but everyone wants to be at the meeting to decide how many kids right. we have in the classroom. And you want to be sensitive to that, but yet recognizing that we have to be trusted as content area experts. Just mm -hmm. like I'm trusting the people at the hospital, I'm trusting the people at the grocery stores, I'm trusting the people you know, at the dome. We need to be trusted to do what's in the best interest of our kids. But you're trying to balance and, and meet that with you know, everything that people are posting, everything people are saying, the emails you're getting, and you still in the midst of all of that noise, you want to get it right. Because we care about the kids. We care about the teachers. You know, we get it that a, a teacher can't come back and teach if they have an um, immunocompromised spouse maybe at home. So we're thinking about all of those things. Um, but that makes it hard to maintain that balance because it's pretty high stakes. You want to get it right. I just want to say I appreciate your candor because there is an element of leadership that pressures you into what you know folks say faking it until you make it. You know, I mean, there's this sometimes there's this need, especially when other folks are looking to you to uh, assume a level of confidence that you may not actually have or a level of self care that you may not actually have. And so I, I think that it's it's very encouraging to hear you speak that way and, and realize, and, and it's, I think it's also important for our audience to hear that, you know, our administrators and our teachers, our, these staffs that, that populate our schools, they're, you know, they're flesh and blood too. Um, and so I think that's something that we, we want to be careful not to lose sight of. Um, I'm going to very quickly thank our annual sponsors. Uh, everyone who's tuned in, please stay with us. Um, uh, Dr. Thomas, when I come back here in just a, a minute or so, what I'd like to ask you about is two themes of our conversation and how they overlap. You've talked about equity. We've talked about JJ Harris. We've talked about technology access. I'm curious how this has affected and how you think it will continue to affect folks that live in areas like Danielsville Road, folks that may have different abilities in shelter of place, built different employment situations, different access to technology, um, things like that. So, um, I'll, I'll be asking that in just one moment. Uh, if you'll permit me just one second, I'm going to uh, bring our sponsors up on screen. Um, so uh, I want to say thanks to everyone who's tuning in. I want to thank uh, Milton and Alex for their comments. If as you're watching this, you have additional questions or comments for Dr. Thomas uh, for the next 10 minutes or so of our program, please feel free to drop it in now. Uh, the people you see on screen here, these are our annual sponsors. These are folks that support us throughout the year. Uh, we're a 52-year-old nonprofit, 501c3. We work to celebrate and conserve community heritage here in Athens, Georgia. Um, but even though we're five decades old, I promise you the bills still come in once a month. Um, and so every uh, sponsor, every donor uh, matters. And so if you'd like to become a donor or a sponsor, uh, just visit historicathens.com. You and your household can become uh, members for as little as $5 a month. And it really, really, really does matter. So we want to make sure we're thanking all the folks here. We also want to acknowledge, as you can see, flashed below the screen here, that each week of our program is brought to you by a different sponsor. This week is, uh, is sponsored by the Dan T. and Sarah Weish uh, uh, Conan Fund at the Athens Area Community Foundation. 
We are so thankful for them for allowing us to have this moment to explore and document uh, this moment in local history. Uh, and so we wanna make sure we adequately thank everyone for that. Uh, also, just briefly, I wanna say this, uh, as I mentioned, we are doing 55 of these interviews. This list that I'm flashing on your screen here, this is the full list of everyone we've spoken to. It includes clergy, the police chief, elected officials, uh, all kinds of folks from all kinds of walks of life, nonprofit leaders, community leaders, um, uh, state rep. If you have any uh, folks on here that you've missed, go back and see the, them in our archive. We also encourage you to keep tuning in every weekday at one o'clock um, for additional episodes. Uh, following each episode at 2 p.m., if you head over to the Athens Welcome Center Facebook page, we also oversee the Athens Welcome Center. Uh, you can uh, check out the live casts including today's live cast, which is an interactive on-site uh, tour of the UGA President's House done by our interim director, Michelle Wynn. Uh, we'd love to see you there and uh, and have you check that out. And then last note, we get a lot of questions on how folks can support us. You can definitely support us as a donor and sponsor. Also, we just premiered three limited edition t-shirts. Um, you can find information on that here on our Facebook page or Instagram page. Um, and those proceeds will help benefit our nonprofit. So thank you so much to the designers that contributed to that and satisfactory printing for printing those. Uh, all right. So Dr. Gunn, thank you for letting me share all of that with our audience. Uh, so uh, going back to this question though, this notion of uh, equity and, and how it takes place during COVID-19. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Um, yes. So we've talked a lot about that as a school system, just recognizing that all of our students don't have access at home to the same level of instructional support. It's challenging. Um, you know, I, I've seen it personally. I've had to you know, purchase some, some learning software for my own child. And I recognize that every family can't just do that. Every family doesn't have a credit card to swipe and go online and get some, you know, math tutorial program or Spanish tutorial program or, or whatever it is. So that's one thing that we have to keep in mind is that we're doing our part as an institution to provide students with what they need to prevent the need for them having to seek outside resources. So that's one. Another area is um, access to the technology that's needed for true, strong digital learning. So, you know, um, right now our schools have computers, laptops for students in grades three through 12, but now we have to go back and look at what are we doing for K one and two. And then if we have those devices, how are we ensuring that they can access what they need at home? Like I mentioned earlier, you know, um, we have been working with the Athens Wellbeing Project, looking at some of their research, seeing where there are digital divides and, and lack of access to technology. So we're going to have to be very aggressive in ensuring that as many of our students as possible have access to internet and that they have access to other tools that they need to, to learn and to advance. You know, we're not just trying to maintain status quo, but we want our students to be able to grow academically. So what are we able to provide in that way? And then of course, you know, our meeting of the needs in terms of um, food and nutrition and you know, equity again and access to make sure that all of our students have what they need at home so that they're able to focus on learning. So those are just some of the areas, Tommy, that we are looking at and have been looking at and will continue to do work around. Thank you. By the way, I, it, it seems to happen once per episode that the train goes by. So you'll have to forgive the noise here in the background. <laughs> Uh, part of the benefit of living in a historic neighborhood. But uh, so we have about three minutes and I have about three questions left for you. So we'll just kind of run through them. I want to make sure we get you out of here on time. 
I don't care if it's that you have a lot to do today or if it's that you're finally taking some small degree of rest. One way or another, I want to get you out of time. So uh, the first question is a simple one. If you woke up tomorrow, quarantine was over, every Athens business was open again, and you could go anywhere you wanted, where would you go? I would probably... I might get a massage. I've been kind of tense lately. <laughs> uh, other than that, you know, I honestly wouldn't rush out of the house. Being home has made me realize how much I'm away from my family normally. And I've really come to appreciate being able to be home with my family. Now, the bad part is when you're home and you're working from home, there's no separation uh, where you right. say, Hey, I'm going to go home and I'm not picking it up because your home is work now. And I, I don't like that part, but I have been able to say, okay, I am home. And I will take a couple of hours just to do something fun with my daughter to look at a movie. And I may stay up on the computer to two o'clock after that, but at right. least, you know, I've had time. I just didn't realize how much I don't see my family until we've been together. So I wouldn't rush back into the world a lot. I, yeah, this is not a bad place to be. <laughs> that's that's really great, and I, I relate for sure. Um, it's nice to be able to cook lunch for your kid, even if it's right, right. Yeah, it's fine. That's right. Um, so, uh, part of what Historic Athens does is historic preservation, and post COVID will likely also be coming kind of post recession. Post recession, a lot of times. Uh, you get a lot of building very fast. Important historic sites can become endangered. And so we're, we're trying to think ahead to what are the places that we need to preserve? What are, what are people's favorite historic places in Athens? Um, when you think of favorite historic places in Athens, what comes to mind? I'll say this really quickly. I was looking at your graphic on the screen and when I did my graduation, my final kind of capstone project in public relations, we worked for the Athens Clark Heritage Foundation and had to create um, a new logo and a campaign for the Heritage Foundation. Oh. So yeah, looking at that took me back. I'm like, wow, even though the name has changed somewhat, that was that was my work. Um, and you know, I know- Can, can I say, I gotta interrupt to say, I, I've long wondered who exactly did the work. When we changed the name, uh, for those of you just tuning in, you know, you know, we were Athens Car Carriage Foundation. Uh, last year, we made the decision. We felt for several reasons that it was time to become Historic Athens. Um, but you know, we didn't change the logo. We didn't even change the font. We just changed the name. And I so, noticed that. <laughs> uh, yeah, clearly your your work lives on. But um, it's been uh, about but, thirty uh, years ago. Wow. Well. That's that's a mystery, major mystery solved for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll have to talk more about that another time. That's interesting. But yeah, uh, favorite historic place. You know, you and I talked about this briefly before we started, but I think I would say there. I have many in Athens, but I do value um, the H.T. Edwards building, and I think it's because in that building every day I'm able to walk through and I see my mother's classmates on the walls. Then I see those of us in my generation. And then I see those students who are there as a part of the Career Academy and the work they're doing moving forward to, to be work ready um, and looking at the opportunities that they will have to change Athens, change Georgia, change the nation. And there are so many people on those walls that have done that. And you know they did that at a time when there were segregated schools. But there are so many people I look at on those walls who are so successful. And it goes back to our earlier conversation that it can be done. And they were in poverty and they were of color. And so that building just serves as a daily reminder to me of what's possible for our kids. Incredibly well said. And yes, it is uh, my first time at H.G. Edwards campus, I was a substitute teacher when it was the alternative school. I think that that, um, you know, that building has been the site for so many legacy points in our community. And so certainly mm -hmm. it's one that we hope if somebody's tuning into this interview 50 years from now, we hope that they can still go visit that campus. Um, so uh, 
my final question concerns that future generation. So if someone, uh, Dr. Thomas, if someone's tuning into this a hundred years from now and looking back at COVID-19 in Athens, Georgia, what would you want them to know about our community at this time? That Athens has been amazing during this COVID-19 period, that our community has pulled together, people have supported our students, our families, our staff, which is actually the Athens community, seeing how we've supported um, our healthcare workers here and seeing what people have done to support our businesses, especially those that are small businesses and what's been done for small business owners. And just that it goes back to when we started this conversation, Tommy, about Athens is a community and mm -hmm. wealth of, of support that's there and available for all of our citizens um, from so many entities has just been wonderful. And seeing even what the community has done for our graduates, you know, so we had a virtual graduation, but I was online and I saw where community members had a full graduation for students and they had a stage and they were calling out names. And, you know, it's kind of that whole, we will rally together around each other and do what's needed to make sure that we all are okay during a time like this. Well, thanks for saying that. Yes, it has been amazing to watch the community respond. I, as a Cedar grad, I've been really inspired watching Principal Derricott, I think visit virtually every sign of every graduating student. It's everyone's pulling together. So uh, we appreciate you being part of that effort. So uh, uh, everyone who's tuned in today, thank you so much. Uh, we uh, will be back tomorrow at one o'clock with our next episode. Uh, to Dr. Janona Thomas, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time with us today. And uh, thank you, Mr. Sams. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. I'll bring that on screen. Let's make that part of the record. Uh, Alex Sams just shared, uh, Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for your leadership. You're bringing a welcome stability to our schools and community. So uh, thank you, Alex, for that comment. And, and thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that stability. So. Uh, all right, uh, I, Dr. Uh, Zernona and I, Dr. Thomas and I are gonna uh, go offline. Uh, everyone else, please stay safe and healthy. If you have the luxury of having today as a holiday, please use it as a holiday and invest in some self-care. And um, we'll be back tomorrow at one o'clock. Thank you so much. Have a great day.